Hi everybody, my name is Walter and I'm going to present to everyone a video uh, I made. It's called Eyes on the Screen, a Jane Jacobs inspired talk about Rose City. Now, before the virus happened, I did walking tours uh, around Windsor. And here's a photograph of me doing one for Walkerville for Museum Windsor. And uh, besides doing walking tours, I like going on walking tours for the Jane's Walk uh, specifically. So here's another image of the urban planning team from the city of Windsor doing their Jane's Walk of last year, 2019. And I've been going on these Jane's Walk walking tours for a couple of years now. So here's a photograph of a Jane's Walk I took. I, I took this photograph um, in New York City in the East Village. And if you want to know more about Jane Jacobs, I would say she's more of a writer. She was never an urban planner, but she always critiqued the urban planning decisions that was made of the day. And she wrote the book, Death and Life of Great American Cities. And that book is deeply influential uh, to urban planning and thinking about uh, cities in general uh, since its publication, 1961. So she lived for a good duration of her life in New York City. And then also she lived the rest of her life in Toronto. But if you want to know more about her, uh, I'd recommend this film. Uh, it's just for people living in Ontario. Sorry, everybody else. This film is called Citizen Jane Battle for the City. And I'll put the link in uh, the description below this video. So I'm going to start with my first quote from Death and Life of Great American Cities. Think of the city and what comes to mind. It's streets. If a city streets look interesting, the city looks interesting. If they look dull, the city looks dull. You could see this view of an abandoned 7-Eleven facing north on Wyandotte Street West. This is dull. So uh, from the Jane Jacobs quote, the city looks dull. On the south side of Wyandotte Street West, the same location. It's just the opposite side of the road. You see uh, some restaurants and a food bank, and this looks interesting. So from the Jane Jacobs quote, the city looks interesting. And going back to that vacant uh, 7-Eleven, I'm just curious as far as, okay, how, how can we put pressure on um, making sure this space just doesn't sit like this? It doesn't sit dull. And according to Google Maps, uh, this vacant 7-Eleven has been there since 2009. Now I know I have a 90% uh, belief that this is still up. <laughs> there might be a chance that, it, that it's been demolished. But um, this uh, this made me think about this group that, uh, that organically happened. It's called Vacant Windsor, and it's a bunch of other people who are very passionate about the city of Windsor. And they documented sites of uh, blight, sites of vacant buildings, as you can see, commercial, industrial, vacant lots, residential, and uh, public, vacant public buildings. And it's very inspirational, uh, the, t the work that they did. Um, as you can see, it's very robust as well, basically covering uh, the great majority of the city. And I wanted to focus on Indian Road. Now, as you can see right here, pretty much all of the houses on the east side of Indian Road, according to this map, are you know considered to be vacant. This is something I know pretty well because back in 2011, I wrote a Canadian public policy paper about it in political science about why are these homes abandoned? You know what happened? What is going on here? So to kind of go back, uh, here's an article from 2009. And there's a group from Sandwich Town, they called themselves the Boarded Up Houses Demolition Action Group. They wanted these houses to be torn down, and this even went to the Supreme Court of Canada. Here is the Corporation of the City of Windsor and the Canadian Transit Company, which is the Canadian uh, affiliate of the Ambassador Bridge Company. So as you can see, this was all about these homes on Indian Road. I'm just going to read out number eight here. This is taken from that uh, Supreme Court case. So uh, it talks about the Ambassador Bridge Company buying out 114 homes 
These purchases have been a source of considerable tension between the company and the city of Windsor. The city believes the company has abandoned and neglected the properties and they have become a blight on the old Sandwich Town neighborhood. So when I went into grad school, I kept thinking about this case study and I made this drawing, as you can see right here. And you could see the brown, the green, the yellow layers on these houses on the east side of Indian Road. And uh, you could see uh, written out text such as Supreme Court of Canada. So what I was trying to do in this image here was to show all of the layers that could affect homes and ultimately lead them to be vacant, derelict, uh, abandoned. Here are some of the images I took of some of these homes on Indian Road and ultimately I started to have a feeling of despair and I, out of, as an artistic response I made these uh, little ghosts and I actually put them on the houses on Indian Road here. Here's an example. And <laughs> I'm not the only one that has done something like this. A professional artist, an Australian artist, he has put up a, uh, a huge Homer Simpson on an abandoned 7-Eleven at Tecumseh Road East at Central. And this was put up around 2011, 2012. And what I came to realize was that it might seem very permanent, you know, you pass these spaces day to day, week to week, month to month, but eventually they get transformed, they get demolished, they get turned into something else. So, for example, this is the same location, present day, you know, you could see uh, all these different services, restaurants, other businesses. So it, it's just temporary. You just have to, you just have to think about that. Uh, here's another example. Uh, downtown Windsor, I passed this building, I'd say day to day, week to week, and I just had a feeling of dread when I would pass by this building, but it's gone. It's gone. And that's the important thing to think about. You know, they're working on it, you know. Either the property owners or the city of Windsor, you know, but it's always important to add some pressure, you know, because uh, ultimately, we're talking about we're talking about people's lives, right? Uh, it's hard to uh, get people motivated. And I'm going to go back to that quote uh, about Jane and saying, uh, "If it looks dull, then the city looks dull, right?" You know, it's a reflection of of what's going on internally when you see these physical spaces outside. So instead of despair, I've been looking at this one building on Drewlard quite a bit. Uh, when I go up and down Drewlard Road. And here's a photograph of what it looked like in the past. Here's a photograph I accessed from the Southwestern Ontario Digital Archive. And as you can see, it's a food products limited industrial food services business. So that's pretty neat. And, you know, as a sign of respecting the building's history, I made this, uh, I made up this idea. <laughs> it's it's kind of living in my head and uh, just throwing it out there of this building to become a diner and uh, it could service the folks who use the Ford test track nearby and instead of despair I choose optimism of course this is an idea <laughs> I just uh, just wanted to throw it out there I made this design uh, forgive my graphic design skills here now to go back to the Indian Road situation, like I said, uh, those homes ultimately became, uh, they ultimately were demolished as you can see right here. Here's an image uh, looking north and then here's an image uh, looking south on uh, just basically all that, that space where all those houses used to occupy on the east side of Indian Road. So the city is making progress on reducing vacant buildings as you could see from this article uh, that was published in 2019 from CBC Windsor. And uh, the city of Windsor itself made their own vacant buildings map. And uh, this map is pretty uh, current as well, 2018. Okay, so I'm gonna go to my second Jane Jacobs quote. There must be eyes upon the street, eyes belonging to those we might call the natural proprietors of the street. The sight of people attracts other people. It's something that city planners and city architectural designers seem to find incomprehensible. They operate on the premise that city people seek the site of emptiness, obvious order and quiet. Nothing could be less true. People's love of watching activity and other people is constantly evident in cities everywhere. 
here you could see uh, people coming together. Uh, they closed the street off and it was the fireworks night of last year. And of course, this event happens once a year, but I think besides the fireworks, which of course are the main thing that pulls everybody in, I could only imagine how uh, looking at all the crowds of people taking over Riverside Drive as well definitely adds to the experience of the fireworks night. Jane Jacobs, she was talking about how, how planners and, and architects, they think that imposing order and uh, emptiness on the street is, is what they want. And then keep in mind that she's talking about her lived experience in the, this would be the late 50s, early 60s. The book was published in 1961. So she was pretty much critiquing stuff like this. Of course, <laughs> of course, her examples are New York City based, but uh, I wanted to sh show a Windsor example. And I really do like this building, the Paul Martin building. But to reference the quote again, you could see on the street, it, it does impose an order and emptiness, if you may. You know, not really a lot of chances for folks to activate the space on the street, you know, especially uh, as you could see <clears throat> on the pit side. Uh, you just really have that one entrance and that's it. Uh, same thing on the Olette side. And I do know the Windsor Public Library, they have moved in and uh, they are operating from the back of the building. And after the virus is over, after the pandemic is over, I really hope that <laughs> uh, they will uh, find more creative opportunities to activate more of this space either on Olette or Pitt Street. So here's an example coffee exchange. I took this from their Facebook account and the Paul Martin photograph it, um, postcard. I took that from the Southwestern Ontario Digital Archive. Anyways, from the coffee exchange, here's them using the space on Olette Avenue. This is summer, people enjoying themselves out on the patio, extended patio, and they're doing the eyes on the street. So, you know, they're paying attention to other people, um, maybe casually, but if something uh, was going to happen, there's an extra set of eyes for additional safety, you know, additional uh, uh, people looking out for each other. So this is the sort of stuff that Jane Jacobs is talking about in her quote. Okay, my next Jane Jacobs quote. Generalized parks can do and add great attraction to neighborhoods that people find attractive for a great variety of other uses. They further depress neighborhoods that people find unattractive for a wide variety of other uses, for they exaggerate the dullness, the danger, the emptiness. With this quote, you could think of parks that exist today that you might be using on an often basis, such as myself. And I thought about the Riverfront Trail, the Riverfront Park, and it's great for a number of reasons, right? Like I'll say personally, I love I love the water, Detroit River. I love looking at the skyline of Detroit, but specifically on the riverfront, uh, on our riverfront, I love our trail. Um, I love that I could ride my bike from the West End all the way to Walkerville if I want to, and it's uninterrupted, really. I just have that one trail. And um, I like that there is art placed all on the trail. I like that it's well maintained and it gets me to downtown. It gets me to all these different places without uh, any sort of fear of a car. I think of it as a transportation link as well. Uh, but that's specifically with, with the bike in my head. It's a great resource to just walk, right? And besides that, I also love the Ojibwe Park and the Black Oak Heritage Park. And I really do feel like I'm in nature when I'm walking through those parks. But, you know, I know that they're both maintained by the city, owned by the city. So, you know, with those parks in mind, you know, I wanted to introduce you know, this, this talk into a park that has been going through a good amount of difficulty and it's called Gateway Public Park. Just a little bit of information of a historic building that's located just right on the edge of 
Gateway Public Park is that there is the Sandwich, Windsor, and Amsburg car barns. And um, there, it was built in 1886. And it used to be the home of the streetcars. When we used to have streetcars in Windsor, uh, which was discontinued in the 1930s. Here's an image from the Southwestern Ontario Digital Archive where you could see the car barn, uh, basically where the guy is in the middle of the street. So the car barn is on the left. This image is from the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s. So what you're looking at right here is a part of an article written by Michelle Soulier. Uh, shout out to her. She wrote this article about this park, Gateway Public Park. And this was about 10 years ago. And this was on the Broken City Labs website. And if you don't know Broken City Lab, they used to be an artist collective that was really interested in the built environment, Windsor, and ideas, and other creative artistic things to do that would help the city in some way. I like to say that they did Jane's Walks before Jane's Walks was a thing. So uh, it's just kind of crazy to see uh, in this article, for example, this is what Michelle wrote that I highlighted. When I went to visit the International Gardens, the park, the physical condition of it was rough. And I could say that basically what she said nine years ago still holds up to be true. And um, one important thing I didn't mention yet about this park is that there is actually a fright tunnel underneath the park. I pulled this article from the Windsor Evening Record. Superintendent Ben Gass was the first man to walk under Detroit River. And this article is from October 18th, 1909. We're talking about the Michigan Central Railroad uh, that was connected between Windsor and Detroit. And that was done in 1910. It's been pretty difficult to maintain a park, which was established by Jack Renner and a bunch of other local community members about 15 years ago and uh, here's another image of the coffee exchange uh, staff members uh, shout out to Amanda for uh, organizing uh, co-organizing this um, cleanup effort they cleaned the park the gateway public park this was last year that you're looking at and it's hard to maintain something that's owned by a company that is Canadian Pacific Rail and then also um, the Detroit River Tunnel Company. They both own uh, pretty much the park. So Ann Jarvis from the Windsor Star last year, she wrote an article about this park. And she was talking about how the park can't be developed with the rail tunnel underneath it. But... To talk about one of the images I started with earlier, instead of despair, I have optimism. I feel optimistic about this park because local councillors that represent this area are also in agreement about this park being used again, or at least uh, used in a way that it's not so scary to be in the park. And there's been negotiations with city and the property owners of this park to, to kind of uh, get this thing going again. Here's some images I took on April 29th of this park. As you can see, it's very interesting because you could see uh, there, there was that bench without the seat, but you could also see right here the cherry blossoms. I believe cherry blossoms trees, they're uh, in full bloom. And I gotta say, this has been one of the best things. <laughs> this has been one of the best things I've seen uh, during this state of uh, quarantine. From the photos I took of the SWNA barn, Two years ago to the photos I took yesterday, it looks like there's been some newish damage to the barn. And perhaps the strangest thing of all is I was down there by myself and I was thinking how this park has so much potential. It kind of feels like a mystery, to be honest, um, that it's at a state where it feels like consistent garbage is scattered throughout the park, such as this mattress. But the entrance from Riverside is is pretty well maintained. That's a story to be continued. So here's another Jane Jacobs quote. Many city occupants and enterprises have no need for new construction. What we need, and a lot of others need, is old construction in a lively district with some among us can help make livelier. 
so you can see this this postcard from Southwestern Ontario Digital Archive, Our Lady of the Lake. They were able to reuse that building, which is called Water's Edge t today. Um, some other things have not lasted throughout the decades, such as the Ford City Town Hall, as you can see in the bottom right corner, and the streetcar that you can see in the middle of the road on Riverside Drive. They've been programming interesting events besides weddings. There was a fashion show at the Our Lady of the Lake, and I got to see it. It was, it was well done. Here's a commercial space downtown Windsor. I never thought this was going to be reused. Uh, it was an old convenience store. And to, to reference one of the images earlier, I did have a feeling of despair when I passed by this building. And lo and behold, how wrong I was. This uh, fashion company from the Sandwich area, they moved their store from Sandwich to uh, this space, downtown Windsor, low end. So it's, it's great that they did that. And as you can see here, it's the Walker Power Building, designed by Albert Kahn. And it's incredible that they were able to reuse the bare bones of this building for, for it to be currently used right now. The services of Baker Tilly, and I'm sure other commercial services after the, the pandemic is over. Okay, here's my next Jane Jacobs quote. Among the most admirable and enjoyable sights to be found along the sidewalks of big cities are the ingenious adaptations of old quarters to new uses. The townhouse parlor that becomes a craftsman showroom, the stable that becomes a house, etc. So it's kind of continuing on the quote that I was talking about before this quote. And uh, this is an image of the old fire station in Sandwich. And it's incredible that they turned it into a Windsor Public Library branch, the John Muir Library. Uh, after when all of this is over and libraries are open again, uh, definitely go check them out. So uh, I really uh, love that they built this. And uh, another place, another place I've enjoyed quite a bit since they uh, renovated it, opened it again, uh, University of Windsor Soka campus. Of course, this is the armories. Um, and a little bit of history of, about it. The building was constructed between 1900 and 1902 for the 21st Regiment of Essex County Facilier, later known as Essex Kent Scottish Regiment. You might know this. This is Windsor's first city hall. I'm, I'm going to pull a quote from the, the book, The River and the Land, uh, from Patrick Broad. It's a great history book of Windsor. Completed in 1856, uh, in addition to providing space for municipal council, eventually uh, this building served as a market, opera house, police station, and a jail. During the American Civil War, it was used as a military barracks on several occasions, and the upper floor was converted into a saloon. So this is incredible, all the different uh, uses that this building went through in its lifetime. This is an image of the space where Windsor's first city hall existed, and it's pretty much to the right of Caesars, and it's right on Riverside Drive. So the plaque exists today of this significant space of Windsor's history. So this is my last quote uh, from Jane Jacobs, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. The processes that occur in cities are not arcane, capable of being understood only by experts. They can be understood by almost anybody. And I really like that quote because uh, it's kind of like the spirit of this whole initiative, Jane's Walk, anyways. Anybody could do a Jane's Walk. There is so much power when one person points out something and saying, hey, look at this. Maybe we should think about this. Maybe we should do this. Perhaps maybe you took something from this video that you could use, I hope. So I'm going to finish this talk with something that is close to me, which is biking. <laughs> what you are looking at is an image of the author Charles Montgomery, writer of Happy City. He did a talk at Caesars Windsor last year, and I took a picture of his slide because this is one of the first things he experienced of being in Windsor.
I can only imagine uh, if some cyclists, you know, how many experiences they'll have with something like this. How many times would they feel comfortable with uh, with biking, you know, on a city street? Because, I mean, how many, you know, to be realistic, how many chances is someone going to take to ride on a street if they have, you know, so many uh, uh, moments where they feel threatened or endangered? So I'm going to take a reference from another city. This is my first other city reference. Uh, this is from Copenhagen, Denmark. So you have you have the moving cars to the immediate left, then you have the parked cars in the middle, and then you have the cyclists. Now I think I'm not sure how difficult this would be to implement. Maybe let's say you know on one street, but as a pilot project, I think there's I think there's something really smart about this and. I mean, for a pilot project, right? Uh, there's something so simplistic and genius about this. And I noticed this not too long ago. It was the Walk Wheel Windsor Initiative. It was the active transportation team. They want to make Windsor more uh, bike friendly. And they erected this bike lane, separated bike lane. And there's a lot of power when you actually put things on the road instead of a painted bike lane. And I know as of this recording, there's been uh, a success with city council to open up uh, more space specifically on Riverside Drive in terms of this, uh, this uh, life that we live in now and uh, people need more public space. And that's incredible. And I just hope they continue with that. I hope they don't just settle with, uh, with the lanes on Riverside, but they continue to add more, you know. And then maybe add some uh, uh, items like this on the on the road to encourage more people to bike safely. Uh, thank you so much for listening to my talk, to looking at the images. Uh, stay safe, everybody, and take care. Bye.